Welcome to this short educational webcast. We've created it for your information and professional competence purposes. Although this webcast does not deal with a specific clinical scenario, the information contained should help inform your overall practice and improve your clinical effectiveness. Remember, webcasts are not intended to be full training courses. However, they are intended to improve your confidence when dealing with similar situations. Practitioners must only act in accordance with CPGs and their current scope of practice and status on the register. To some extent, patient safety requires us to accept responsibility and accountability for our own actions. And sometimes that's a very difficult challenge to face, but it's one that we have to take on if we are to ensure that the care that we deliver to patients is absolutely safe and secure. Staff have to embrace the culture of reporting. They have to self-report. They have to basically ensure that they accept responsibility and accountability for their actions. They also have to ensure that they are fully competent and compliant with clinical practice guidelines and that they take every opportunity to reflect on their practice and ensure that both they, the organisation and the system and the regulator in some cases actually learns from the benefit of their experience as practitioners. Above all, transparency is something that at times if we make a mistake, something that's absolutely human, we find it difficult to expose that and that can lead to peer pressure and peer pressure in its own right can basically prevent us from doing the right thing. So I think if we deal with those issues, we can certainly advocate and pro uh, promote and extend the culture of patient safety. When errors occur in patient care, it can generally be one of a number of things. I think the first and most important thing we have to understand and accept is that human beings make errors. So sometimes errors are caused by us, the practitioner. Secondly, errors can, cause, can be caused as a result of the system in which they work. So there may be system errors, for example, where a process or a procedure or a guideline needs to be revisited or reviewed uh, or revised, and that's something that, that can happen. Thirdly, um, sometimes what happens is that there may be a lapse in knowledge, which is not necessarily an error as such, but it may be an indirect form of error in which we don't basically keep ourselves up to speed as practitioners and again that comes back to the whole area of reflective practice, uh, continuing professional competence, seeking out every opportunity to ensure that our knowledge is up to date and that the care that we give to patients is above all uh, absolutely safe and if not don't do it, check. The Safety, Health and Welfare at Work Act 2005 brought a significant focus on the safety of staff at work, however indirectly it did basically yield some benefits for patients in that, for example, if a workplace was safe, if a hospital environment was safe, if a vehicle was safe, indirectly then it meant that the patient or client in some cases who was being brought into that environment was equally safe. What the legislation perhaps has not done to the extent which it could have done is provided some statutory or legislative obligations to ensure that the safe procedures were in place. So. Again, one of the things that we can do is we can learn from that legislation and we can opt to do one of two things. One is we can proactively seek to ensure that patient safety is paramount in everything we do, or we can wait for legislation to make it mandatory, in which case compliance will always be a difficult choice. So it stands to my mind that the most proactive thing that each of us can do as a practitioner is actively seek out every opportunity to make sure that patient safety is above all things the, the right road to follow. In order to ensure uh, a culture of patient safety, we, we need uh, a set of governance in place. And governance is best defined by leadership, by policies, procedures and guidelines. However, all of those things do not, uh, I suppose, replace the need for common sense. And what we need from all of our practitioners is we need a degree of freedom within limits so that people practice safely, but they do so within the confines of a clinical governance framework. So to answer your question, yes we do need uh, a culture of policy, procedure and guidelines, but what we do not need is something that's overly prescriptive. Pre-hospital practitioners have a significant opportunity to uh, influence the evolution of change, particularly in the area of patient safety and clinical practice. 
as practitioners, we should reflect on our practice and we should use that opportunity to feedback both through clinicians and through the regulatory authority, in this case FEC, uh, the benefit of our experiences, which of the practice guidelines works well, which do not work well, which could be improved on and where the opportunities for change are. And if we use that cycle, basically like an audit cycle, where we learn from what happens, we feed it back and basically there's an outcome at the end of it and hopefully we as practitioners can influence the next evolution of patient care. An overly prescriptive patient safety regime could lead practitioners down the road of doing things for the wrong reasons. In other words, for example, taking a blood sugar on a patient where there's absolutely no indication. So we actually start to uh, incur pain and discomfort on patients for all the wrong reasons, not because they require it, but because we feel we have to do it to cover our backs as practitioners. And that's not an area we want to get into. Uh, essentially what we need to do is we need to make sure that our care pathways and our clinical practice guidelines have a sufficient degree of latitude that allows us to basically make clinical decisions for the right reasons, use our, use our judgment to only perform certain tests on patients or certain uh, procedures on patients when we know it's absolutely indicated. One of the ways in which we can ensure that happens is to make sure that people are not benchmarked against a straight line approach. That's one of the ways in which we can do it. So we allow the fact that people who are clinicians or who are pre-hospital practitioners perform against a set of standards but that those standards have some degree of flexibility that allows them to think on their feet, make judgments and be benchmarked on their decisions rather than against a straight line process. The standard of patient care that we would want to ensure applies to our patients is the standard of care that we would want to apply to our loved ones. The way in which we can make that happen is ensure that we adhere to the clinical governance and guidance that's in place that we are familiar with best practice, that we reflect on our own practice, that we self-report any errors, that we encourage others to self-report, that we learn from those errors, and above all, that we share the learning with uh, other practitioners. If we do all of those things, uh, we can certainly encourage and promote a quantum leap forward in patient safety within the ambulance service environment. <laughs>